Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the ninth annual Keller Family Venture Grant Forum for Student Research. I'm thrilled to have you all joining us tonight to celebrate and learn more about the adventures, intellectual adventures of our students. And we're especially pleased this evening to have members of the Keller family joining us. They've been supporting venture grants at Colorado College for many years and have been extremely generous and allow all these amazing things to happen. Tonight we have Jeff Keller from the class of 1991 and his wife Molly. We also have Jeff's brother David Keller from the class of 1995 and his wife Avery. Can we ask the four of you to please stand and we all want to thank you for your generosity. Without their support, um, none of this would be possible and we are very grateful to the Keller Family Foundation. As I, as I said numerous times since I arrived, when I first came to CC, I heard from students about what were those things we absolutely needed to preserve and grow at CC. And I always heard venture grants as being one of those. This research is often original and it goes beyond the classroom into uh, applied fields of knowledge. Uh, venture grants provide opportunities for collaboration between faculty and students, which I know is also extremely valuable. And last year we were able to approve 96 research proposals involving 109 students, which allowed them to travel across the United States and around the globe. Those students are using these grants far and wide, and we're excited to hear from 10 of them in a brand new format tonight. Um, now it's my great pleasure to introduce Ray Evett, Associate Dean of the College and Administrator of our Venture Grant Program. Ray. Hi, I'm so delighted to have you here this evening. It's just great. You have braved the cold. That's a miracle. The Kellers are here. That's a miracle, and you should ask them why. <laughs> we have 12, sorry Jill, 10 presentations, but 12 miraculous presenters, and uh, it's just going to be a really splendid evening. We're trying something very new. Uh, Venture grants are about being entrepreneurial, Jeff was telling me earlier, about bold steps, about making a decision to try something a little different. And uh, we have a great new format tonight. Um, Julian Plaza will be here in a minute to explain what we're up to. Um, I just want to say thank you to all of the students who have been, um, who have been uh, applying for venture grants and, and pursuing this this year. I want to encourage everybody in the audience to keep doing that. Um, we have a number of members from the Dean's Advisory Committee who reads your venture grants. We read anywhere from 25 to 35 each block, and it's uh, a, a really great trip every time. Um, and, uh, and I'm just hoping that you will participate and come see us about how to, how to do this kind of thing, what, to, what passions to follow, and what kinds of things you would like to explore. Um, I'm, I want to introduce Julian Plaza, who is our Director of Forensics and Debate. He and I just discovered that we actually grew up in the same little northern Colorado town, about 30 years apart, maybe 40. <laughs> um, <laughs> 40, <laughs> for sure. And uh, Julian has, um, uh, he was a CC undergrad, and he uh, has uh, pursued a, a master's, gotten a master's in international politics at the University of Warwick in England, and we are lucky to have him back with us um, he's done a marvelous job helping these student presenters uh, figure out how to do an Ignite presentation. So, Julian, would you please share with us what the evening's going to look like? I want to start by echoing a lot of the thank yous. This is the first time I've ever gotten to work with the Venture Grant Forum, and it's been really, really inspiring. Um, so I want to give you a preview of kind of what the events will look like tonight. So first, what you'll essentially see are 10 speeches all in a row, like literally all on just one single PowerPoint. It's the god of all PowerPoints <laughs> that has ever existed. Um, and then afterwards, what we'll do is we'll kind of open it up for a question and answer session. The goal of this is to kind of get through all of these. They're only going to be about five minutes a piece. And that's to pick your interest, essentially. And this Ignite style is kind of new. It's a variant off of Pecha Kucha, which are speeches that b base themselves off of a PowerPoint that uses rolling slides. So every single slide will be about 15 seconds long, and then it'll move on to images. The goal of this is to make speeches intentional so that they can get straight to the point and kind of tell you exactly what they think the takeaways are and exactly how this impacted them. 
So the other nice thing about it is you get to immerse yourself in not only somebody's speech and the words and their feelings and emotions that they experience while going through this, but you also get to be immersed in a lot of the students' photography. I can't think of one presentation that doesn't have just breathtaking photos of the experiences that these students were able to have. Um, the other thing is that it's not long-winded. So you essentially get 10 presentations that are quite short in nature to get to uh, exactly what these students want to talk about. So I would like to start, I guess, uh, the presentations now and get the real stars of the show up here. So I had something up here. Can I grab that from you? Thank you. <laughs> Our first presenter is Ben Feldman. He's uh, giving us a presentation on mole, uh, gastronomical exploration of Oaxaca, and his research advisor was Mario Montagna of the anthropology department, who's also the chair of the microbiology department. Um, this summer, I went to Oaxaca in Mexico to study mole sauce, and I was interested in this topic for a number of reasons, first and foremost being that I love Mexican food, and mole is really claimed to be Mexico's national dish. It's an extremely unique food. Um, it combines culinary techniques from both uh, Asia and Mesoamerica and Europe um, and has a wide variety of ingredients. Um, you know, even though there's 15 types, most, or uh, over 15 types, most moles have some sort of combination of sweet fruit, spicy chilies, uh, nuts, herbs, broth, um, some of them have chocolate, some of them even have burned ingredients too, um, such as tortillas or bread. So as you can imagine, this is a very difficult to dish to make even by modern standards, but if made in the traditional manner on a matate grinding stone, uh, it was an extremely labor-intensive dish to make, sometimes even taking up to three days. Um, so mole, historically, was really only served on extremely special occasions. And as such, there are specific moles served on specific occasions. There's moles for birthdays, moles for Day of the Dead, moles for Saints Days, moles for welcoming a guest into your house, really anything that you can think of. So while I was in Oaxaca this summer, um, I spoke to people to collect stories about mole and try and learn how to make this dish. So I began this process by asking my host mother if she could teach me how to cook mole. And even though she cooked a wide variety of delicious Mexican food, um, she didn't cook this supposedly treasured national dish. And then after that, I, it really felt like I was asking pretty much everyone who I came in contact with if they could share recipes with me. And these were mostly um, you know, employees of museums, bookstores, art galleries, um, a language school, sometimes even taxi drivers. But I was amazed that all these young professionals who I was speaking to um, didn't cook mole, but all of them had grown up eating mole and had fond memories of their mothers making it for them. So I wondered to myself, how do I get in contact with these mothers who are making mole, and where are they? <laughs> um, and it actually wasn't until my fourth week when I was in Oaxaca that I discovered that my own host mother, who had been serving me all this delicious Mexican food, was not the woman who was cooking my food for me, but it was my host mother's mother, my host grandma, who had been cooking all of my food and delivering it next door in Tupperware. <laughs> And by the time I came home for lunch, um, food was already on the table. Um, so as soon as I found this out, I went next door to uh, Carmen's house. This is her right here. And I asked her how to teach me mole, uh, or teach me how to make mole, and she did. And she provided a lot of recipes with me, um, introduced me to a bunch of her friends who cooked mole, and I had the privilege of going to an exhibition, a mole exhibition hosted by the city of Oaxaca, um, where women came in from Pueblos, from all outside of the city, to kind of share and display um, their moles, and I had the opportunity to kind of transcribe some of these recipes. Um, but what really struck me about all this is that all the women who I was speaking to were all over the age of 30. Um, so there seems to be like a really big generational gap in who is cooking mole nowadays. Um, and traditionally in Mexico, it was really women who were responsible for providing for their families. And I actually believe that this role took on a lot more significance than it would in a place like the United States because tortilla making was such a laboriously intensive process. But um, as we see kind of more women moving into the workforce in Mexico, 
Um, there are less women who are cooking mole nowadays, and inevitably some of these oral traditions are going to be lost. So there seems to be kind of a uh, tension between what we may call economic progress and the preservation of traditions. Um, but this is particularly interesting in Oaxaca because Oaxaca's economy is largely dependent on tourism for its success. And tourism, while being a vehicle of economic progress and development, also relies on the preservation of cultural traditions for its success. So my experience in Oaxaca studying mole um, as a way to, which then actually ended up teaching me much more about kind of economic progress and social shifts in Oaxaca, um, left me wondering the question if somehow food tourism as a vehicle of development and globalization may actually be radically changing food traditions. Thank you. Okay, so this September I had the opportunity to travel to 10 different cities within the American Southwest to study urban agriculture. And depending on who you ask, urban agriculture can be defined in many different ways, and it comes in many different forms, such as backyard gardens, growing basil in a broken hot tub, all the way to six acre farms in public parks. Growing food in the city requires a great deal of creativity and resourcefulness, and I was really impressed at all the ways that people were making it happen. So it appears that we skipped a slide. Um, but this is Farmer John, who is 100 years old, and he's been farming in Santa Fe for his entire life. And so he was one of the very many inspiring people who I met there. This is his farm in Santa Fe. Um, so my main research goal was to determine what role urban agriculture played in these cities. And as I expected, urban agriculture alone will not be feeding entire populations anytime soon. Even if it were maximized to its full potential, it is unlikely that it could feed over 20% of a city's population. However, this is no reason to write off urban agriculture because its benefits go far beyond the amount of food produced. And there were four major positive impacts that I identified. And one is increased greenery. Um, and here is a vacant lot in Oakland, California that pretty soon will be turned into an urban garden. So increased gre greenery has the obvious benefit of making places like this more beautiful and a place that neighbors are proud of. Um, also, from an environmental perspective, it reduces harmful runoff and increases shading and can inspire a sense of environmental stewardship in the people who spend time there. And in West Oakland, here at City Slicker Farms, um, it showed how having a green space in your neighborhood can make the neighbors more protective of their area and crime rates will go down. So in City Slicker Farms, they were two weeks into their farm and someone came in and wrecked all the chicken coops and garden beds. But the citizens there were so proud of their farm that they rebuilt it entirely from scratch and created a neighborhood watch team so that something like that wouldn't happen again. And that also speaks to the community development aspect, which is another major impact that I found. Um, and the majority of farms that I visited are in very diverse communities. And in some of these areas, historically, they've had trouble getting along. And so urban farms really bring these populations together by giving them a common purpose. Another result of urban agriculture, which I thought was probably the most important, uh, is education in these communities. And there's a really wide range of this. One example that I was really impressed by was the Santa Cruz Homeless Gardens in Santa Cruz, California, which has been operating for over 20 years. And they specialize in job training and education for the homeless population of the city. And every year they mentor 20 to 30 homeless citizens and teach them everything from how to compost to running the farm stand to business management. And the other example that greatly impressed me was Urban Roots in Reno, Nevada. And they're a summer camp that reaches hundreds of kids every year and teaches them about healthy eating and their food systems. So this brings me to the fourth major benefit that I found of urban agriculture, and that is empowerment. So empowerment typically comes as a pleasant side effect of the education aspect. So many of the farms seek people from at-risk populations for volunteer and sometimes employee positions. And giving these people a role in their community gives them a sense of purpose and dignity that empowers them to try and change their situation. Such as Joseph um, from West Oakland, California. He was a drug dealer for a number of years and then found the farm and now works there full time. Another way that empowers people is that children and adults are now empowered to make better dietary choices now that they have had an active role in food production. 
So not so coincidentally, my major, my senior thesis is on urban agriculture in the Southwest and being able to actually go to the places that I'm writing about and put a human face to the farmers that I'm depicting has been huge in making my thesis something that I'm proud of and something that will contribute to the academic understanding of urban agriculture. So I would like to conclude by thanking everyone who made this possible to Eric Paramond, my project advisor, and thank you to the Venture Grant Committee for giving me this opportunity. Thank you to Julian and Sarah for helping me so much with this presentation. And thank you so much to the entire Keller family for making it out here and giving me the opportunity to explore my interests. So I'm Brad Green. My name is Adam Young. I'm a California native. Um, I'm actually a Nevada native, but I spent a lot of my weekends in California. I'm an Eagle Scout who's hiked all across the mountain ranges in California. Um, I'm an environmental policy major and Phil Miner who loves spending my weekends skiing and hiking in the Tahoe region. Like Adam, I have also spent my weekends <laughs> skiing throughout the Lake Tahoe region. So here's a photo of us on Lassen Peak where we started our venture grant journey um, at the snowpack exploring these three-year drought in California and we're up there about you know, 8,000 feet doing some skiing. A little higher. Yeah. <laughs> So with um, all of our outdoor backgrounds, Adam and I thought it would be an excellent idea to document the drought in California and see the effects that it's having on as many people as possible. Yeah. Um, we, began our, we began our interview process with experts in the field. So we got um, but the fire chief at Squaw Valley and this hydrologist, Adam Sullivan. Um, and these expert interviews allowed us to get a more solid background and just kind of yeah. ask us a little bit more questions about what's really happening in California. Yeah, exactly. So and in addition to some of these more science-based, like, uh, objective interviews, we also looked for people who had interesting stories about how the drought was affecting them. Um, this is Jim. Uh, he lives in Grass Valley, California, and he, about 80% of his diet comes out of his backyard. Um, he grows all of his own food. Um, and he had some pretty moving stories about how this uh, drought has affected him. So up next is a picture of Lake Oroville. Um, Lake Oroville is the second largest reservoir in California, and it's one of the most commonly written about. For example, there's a New York Times article about a month ago. Um, but Lake Oroville is down to 25% of its normal capacity, and just traveling to some of these locations was heartbreaking to see. Yeah, so a lot of these reservoirs were very low, and that was troubling to see. You can see the trees exposed in the top left of this photo at uh, Shasta Lake. And this was a, a biologist who we interviewed who actually proposed to his wife um, on Shasta Lake when it was at normal levels. So it kind of had a, an emotional response from him about how this drought is affecting his life. So the drought, or sorry, the uh, interview process wasn't just emotional for the people we were interviewing. It was emotional for Adam and I. Um, we used to sit in the backseat of our cars, driving all across California and look out and see luscious agricultural green crops. But now we drove past the summer and would look out and see brown fields or even fallow fields. Yeah, and as it goes with any filmmaking process, you run into a bunch of unforeseen trouble. Um, this is a photo of my car getting towed after the engine overheated <laughs> while we were out in the field trying to get interviews across Northern California. So. <laughs> You, a lot of times you run into uh, kind of some troubles that you don't plan in your outline of your venture grant proposal. <laughs> <laughs> but um, for every hardship that we had, I would say we had an experience that was twice as rewarding. It was absolutely incredible to be able to hike, ski, fish, and, and just enjoy California's natural beauty. Yeah, along with that, I mean, like, we learned a lot on this grant. Uh, we, um, California is in a three-year drought right now, so um, there's sequential three years of drought it's like taking a huge five billion dollar i think hit to the global or to the american economy so so this is just part of our um, memorable experiences waking up to watch the sunrise above donner lake and tahoe was probably one of the highlights on our yeah. trip we set up an inner velometer to take photos every 10 seconds got a sweet time lapse at the end mm -hmm. <laughs> so um all in all we don't have a lot of time but um, in Adam and I's lives, we see this drought and water issue being a challenge that we're going to face for the rest of our lives. So in the future, we're going to need to continue to ask questions and continue to do more research in order to attempt to find a solution. So here's just a quick um, um, graphic. If you looked at the far right column, 
you can see that one year ago, 0% of California was in an exceptional drought, while today, or as of November 4th, over 55% of California was in an exceptional drought. And this isn't just going to be affecting California. California has been the largest um, agriculture and food production for 50 consecutive years. Yeah, 50, so 50% 50 of our food comes from um, agriculture, or 50% of our fruits and vegetables come from California. So it doesn't just affect the way we recreate. It affects food prices across <laughs> the country, and I mean, we're seeing that today. So, so um, I think that Adam and I kind of concluded, in order to attempt to solve um, this water solution, we needed to educate ourselves before we could ed educate others. So hopefully our documentary um, depicts our thoughts and can help educate some other people along the way too. Yep, and so we will be screening this documentary hopefully first week of next block in this very room. Look for posters. We'll be screening it with another movie that uh, myself and a colleague worked on. So uh, get excited. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Our next pair of presenters are Cora Lubchenko and Ellen Gilbertson. They will be presenting on foreign medical volunteerism, and their research advisors are Salvino Bizarro and Tara Misra. <clears throat> Up at 6 a.m. to the sound of a Dominican <coughs> peacock. Pack a pharmacy in a wound care kit, walk to a community's church, and turn their pews around. See upwards of 60 patients of any age and any complaint in a single day. Some of these people have waited for eight hours in the hot sun just to sit down next to me, and some of them have been waiting since the organization last came six months ago. I was given 14 days to translate for this vibrant community desperately in need of health care. It all began when a young boy escaped the cycle of village life, made it to the United States for med school, and then returned to the clinic, er, returned to his people to build a clinic like so few others had done. 19 years later, this clinic overflows each morning, patients presenting with everything from malaria to machete wounds. I was fortunate enough to live there for two months this summer. Cultural, linguistic, and political obstacles can make medical volunteerism frustrating for both patient and volunteer, and we have to wonder how much we can really affect the lives of these individuals within the realities of an unequal globe. Working in a different country often reveals <laughs> shockingly different legal realities, and the judicial system in the village of Masara where I was working is basically non-existent, so Cases of rape, for example, often go unreported or even ridiculed. This is incredibly frustrating, especially as the victims are often as young as my little sister. What am I supposed to tell these little girls, and how do I keep them safe? Um, frustration. So a man um, tells me that the trees are blurry. And in our clinic, we've got bifocals, but we don't have, or we have reading glasses, but we don't have any bifocals. Um, so Telling this man to go to his local optometrist is silly, I know, because he already told me that this clinic is his only form of health care. And so, like more patients than I care to admit, I hand him his complimentary toothbrush, and we're out of toothpaste, and um, his multivitamins, and I instruct him to take them un dia si, un dia no, which means every other day. And he looks at me, and he asks me <laughs> if he'll help his eyes, and I don't know what to say to that. Trust can define, in a large part, the quality of care that a patient's going to receive. The patient has to trust the interpreter, you have to understand your doctor, and you have to support your neighbor. And when you don't have this trust, patient interaction can become incredibly difficult. Uh, one of the big barriers I faced working in Kenya is that many of the small children are just terrified of my skin color. And so they'll run away from me screaming, Mzungu, Mzungu, which means white person, and I can't even do anything with them. And that's very frustrating. But Worse is the men. Uh, this guy in the red hat is a member of a religious group who, like the male members, won't even let me touch them. I can't even take their blood pressure. It, it just their IV drips. So that kind of lack of trust is also very difficult um, in forming interactions. So here's how to use an inhaler. You empty your lungs, you push the button, you breathe in, you hold it, and then you release. And that sounds easy, but to a 70-year-old Dominican man, it's anything but. Um, so at one point, we've got a doctor, a nurse, myself, and five rowdy women from the community helping this man to learn to use his new prescription. Um, trust between the interpreter and the patient and the doctor is so crucial in seeing a better health outcome, and especially the role of the community in him learning how to use this device he's never seen is so important. But we also found that despite some interactions that made us feel inadequate, a majority of them sort of instilled in us this beautiful sense of hope because we realized that you can break these walls of race and language and worldview. 
So for example, a girl tugs on my shirt and she shows me a rash she has, <coughs> and I grab a nurse who diagnoses it as scabies and she prescribes a cream. So I squat down next to the girl and I explain that tonight she should put it all over her body and sleep like that, and in the morning wash it all off, wash her clothes, leave them in the sunshine, and she'll be all better. And I ask her to recite this prescription back to me, and she does so flawlessly, and then she smiles and she says that she can't wait. And if you ask me, that's hope and strength in the face of adversity. So this is Vincent. He's 20 years old, exactly my age. And you can't really tell from the picture, but he's lost most of his lower limbs to leprosy. Um, he doesn't have his own wheelchair, so when he's not at the clinic, he gets around by literally dragging himself by his elbows. Um, but he's got this big, wide, warm smile and a firm handshake, and he never sh shows anything that even approaches self-pity. And he's mostly just concerned with taking care of his little sister and paying for her school fees. So I think what we've really taken away from these projects is that if you hurdle frustrations, you're going to get a level of trust. And you can use that level of trust to get a movement. In reality, location, we've learned, just doesn't matter in the context of fundamental health care. Crossing national borders shouldn't change anything. And as we both move forward with our plans of medical school, this is a very important principle for us. And we will never forget these people and these cultures from whom we have learned so much. And we are so immensely thankful to the Keller family for providing us these opportunities. I'd like to welcome our next uh, presenter, Flora Lee, who is presenting on understanding bacterial nanomachines. Her research advisor was Phoebe Lostro, who's the associate professor in molecular biology and the director of the Feminist and Gender Studies program. All right, so good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here tonight. Um, it's very nice to see so many of you. Um, I would like to share my research and the opportunities that's brought me uh, with you tonight. And, but first of all, I'd like to thank the Keller family, the National Science Foundation, and uh, the Color College Office of the Deans for founding this research. I'd also like to thank Dr. Phoebe Loistro for advising me um, and guiding me through my project with the bacterium Acinetobacter bailei. This research has brought me life-changing opportunities um, for personal growth as well as professional development. I was able to take this research um, to four different conferences in the last three months here in Colorado and all the way to Chicago to present what I found. And I even won first place for undergraduate poster presentation at the American Society of Microbiology. In the upcoming year, I'll be taking my research to San Diego in April and Greece in June uh, to, pre to present my results again. And not only so, this research has best opened my uh, academic, uh, viewing the academic world, as well as, um, you know, serve, increase my reputation, serve as a springboard for me in the scientific world. My research with Acinetobacter bailei, which is a non-disease-causing bacterium, extends, um, the important extends to other infectious diseases. Um, the most notable ones are cholera and gonorrhea. The gon if we just focus on gonorrhea, the gonorrhea today is resistant to m almost all the antibiotics we have. And with the fact that pharmaceutical companies have decided to stop all fundings for antibiotic research, very soon we'll have no effective treatments against gonorrhea. So we hope by getting more understanding of Acinetobacter bailei, a close relative to gonorrhea, we'll, we'll ha maybe one day have a more effective treatment for infectious diseases like gonorrhea. So how I went about my research and what I studied was these nanomachines called pili that, that are built outside of the cells. And they're approximately five times the length of the cell. They're really, really long, and they have two functions. One of them is called twitching motility, and the other one is called natural competence. Twitching motility is the act of throwing out uh, the, the pili, grabbing onto a surface, and they pull themselves forward. And this is what uh, twitching motility looks like in Pseudomonas and Rhodonosa. And this is uh, important because this is how they move and this is how they attach to surfaces like the human skin, for example. Another function is called natural competence. Natural competence is the ability to acquire new genetic information. And this is medically relevant because this is how bacteria can uh, acquire antibiotic resistance 
um, really, really fast as soon as within 24 hours. So if you think about that 24 hours, like next day, your bacterial infection will be resistant to your antibiotics. That is pretty scary. So how I went about studying these pili is I isolated the building blocks of these pili and, uh, from living cells, then determined the concentration uh, of my samples. Then I separated each building block um, uh, by size using electrical conduction. And finally, I visualized the, uh, the building blocks um, by staining them. Each, each, in, sorry, each individual band you see in the photo represents an uh, individual building block. And from my analysis of these building blocks and other results from the lab, we came to two proposed structure of what these building blocks might look like. So we, th we think that the co there are two types of um, pillar being made. So there's a competence pillars and the twitching pillars. However, they have very different um, functions, but they have very similar structures. They, they share a similar base. On the top left diagram, that's the base they share. On the bottom right diagram, um, the only difference they have is denoted in the colors. So even though they have two different functions, very different functions, they are built very similar, which is very interesting. So what we would like to do next um, is we would like to look at these pili underneath the electron uh, transmission electron microscope and we'll, um, to see if we can actually s tell the difference between the two pili. And we also like to run a Western blot to determine how much of, um, how much of each building block is actually being made outside of the cell. So for our research, we gain a lot of understanding uh, about the structures and the function of this pili. And we hope by continuing our research, we'll uh, gain more knowledge and be able to apply this knowledge for other infectious diseases. So on the journey to uh, improve, uh, for improving our health and develop a better treatment, um, my research is just the beginning. Thank you very much. So our next presenter is Bara Hansilova, and she is presenting on Colorado Springs Engineers Without Borders in Bolivia. And her uh, legal scholar and resident uh, research advisor is Phil Cannon. Imagine a remote community living in the mountains where the closest connection to civilization is a bus stop one and a half hour long walk away. This community has limited access to clean drinking water and they are lacking a reliable irrigation system for their crops, which are their main source of income. Now imagine that you have to design and build a system to provide them with water they can drink and irrigate their crops with. This was the position that I was in while working with Ingenieur Sveaboris in Bolivia this past summer. To give you an idea of what this was like, I would like to briefly describe the project I was a part of and then discuss some of the development implications and realizations I encountered during my venture grant trip. On the 20th of May 2014, a team of four professionals and two students uh, from the Color Springs chapter of Ingenious Real Waters landed in Bolivia um, to finish their five-year-long water supply project in Suncayo, a community of 200 families uh, living at 13,000 feet in the Bolivian Andes. Since 2009, the local EWB chapter has worked with Suncayo to build two pipelines from the mountain springs to the community, install tanks to store water in the dry season, and set up tap stands uh, accessible to all inhabitants of Suncayo. In 2014, I was thrilled to help with the final repair of the pipelines and thus provided the community with clean drinking water as well as permanent irrigation source. Now that I have described the project uh, I was involved with, I want to discuss what I learned about human development that follows infrastructure development. Even though I was engaged in planning the trip and discussing the impact of the project prior to the trip, I didn't realize the process of human development that follows infrastructure development until I interacted with the Sunkaya community myself. I heard from the teacher in Sunkaya that due to the help of EWB Colorado Springs, students have been less sick and have missed less classes. In this, I saw the first step of a virtual cycle, which I hope to take effect over the next several decades. Since the improved tap water system yields uh, better health standards for the children, they are able to attend school more often. I believe that with this education, 
these children will be one day able to find better jobs and thus uh, be empowered to improve their own living standards as well as those of their future families. When I was in Tsunkaya, I didn't meet anyone from the age of 15 to the age of 50. That is because everyone left for bigger cities to look for better opportunities. However, as the water situation in Tsunkaya has improved, the community leaders uh, start looking for uh, the former Tsunkaya residents to come back, realizing that living in Tsunkaya uh, provides better uh, living standards than, those of, uh, than uh, those of the slums of bigger cities can offer. Lastly, the members of the community gain several hours every day by not having to walk to collect their water from distant springs. As I know them, they will utilize this time by working more on their crops and thus getting a higher income for their families. So um, I have here described the impacts of our water supply project um, on the human development <coughs> in Sunkaya. And now I will talk about the importance of community engagement and ownership in order for the project to be sustainable in the long run. Throughout my life, I wondered if development by foreign organizations has real impact or just makes the community dependent. Um, last summer, I learned that it is possible for these impacts to be positive. By offering little advice and light supervision, as uh, opposed to the organization doing all the work for the community, um, project operations can be continued self-sufficiently by the community. The engineers from, uh, mm, without borders from Colorado Springs visited Tsunkaya only five times um, uh, each year for approximately two weeks. Rather than doing all the implementation themselves, they mostly supervised the community in laying the pipe and building the tam tanks and tap stands. After the project was implemented, the team from Colorado Springs spent two years training a few community members in, uh, the, main in the operation and maintenance of the system. This summer, other team members and I were very pleasantly surprised by discovering four miles of pipeline and two large concrete tanks uh, already in place, which the community built by itself on contracting a local engineer. Last summer, we concluded that Tsunkaya is self-sustainable in maintaining their water system and that therefore we will not come back to provide further assistance. So hopefully, after this presentation, you can think about infrastructure development differently. In the future, <laughs> perhaps, <laughs> you can refer to this as an example, um, uh, as a project that has made positive uh, sustainable development, and you can use this as a case study when considering future ways to improve humanitarian quality of life. Thank you to my academic advisor, Barbara Witten, who supported me in applying for this venture grant. Thank you to the Ingenious Without Borders Colorado Springs chapter, which enabled me to participate on this project. And thank you to the Keller family and Colorado College uh, for such a wonderful opportunity. Thank you. Um, our next presenter is Alexandra Drew, and she will be presenting on no policy as <laughs> policy in Tanzania. And her research advisor was actually Phil Cannon, our resident <laughs> leader, <laughs> and uh, in the environmental program. So. <laughs> Hello, my name is Alexandra Drew, but everyone here calls me Druzy. And this past fall, I was given a wonderful opportunity to study abroad in Tanzania and increase my environmental awareness. So in the US, we have this belief that to preserve land and to keep it safe, we have to separate it from the humans. We build parks, we build national forests, we build national scenic trails. And I intrinsically believed that this works for everyone, for everywhere you go. And before coming to CC, I was awarded an opportunity to volunteer on a conservation crew on the Pacific Crest Trail and the Florida National Scenic Trail, and really got to see the separation that we put between people and ecosystems for the preservation of people and for the preservation of ecosystems. So last fall, I went to Tanzania, which is in East Africa, to explore their national park system, as they were inspired by the American national park system, and I wanted to see how it was working there. So my first project is I went to Tarangiri National Park and I evaluated the park boundaries. So when the park was established and made into a conservation area, all of the local people who were living where the park is were kicked off and forced to have the same amount of cattle and the same amount of children and the same amount of farmland and a much smaller parcel of land. So as you can see from this photo, Walking along the park boundary, there is a dramatic difference between the amount of dead grass in the park and the amount outside of the park. And it's all dead because it's the dry season, 
but there's a dramatic less amount on the outside due to overgrazing and overuse. As the local pastoralists now have an eighth, a half the amount of land they used to have. And the other interesting part about this is animals and ecosystems don't see the boundaries the way we do. So giraffes run free, elephants run free, the flora and fauna travel back and forth, and the degraded conditions outside of the park negatively impact the inside of the park, rendering the land intended for conservation ineffective. Why would you make a park to save a piece of land if it's not working? And that's what I found in Tarangire. So I was curious about what about not managing the land? What if we just let it be and didn't try and conserve it in a park or a national forest? Would it work? Could people and ecosystems live together successfully? So for my venture grant, I went to a popular tourist area in Tanzania that is not a park, uh, Old Doingo Langai, which is a volcano in the Rift Valley, very well known because it is on Lake Natrone, which is a very popular place for Europeans to come vacation and safari and enjoy their free time. So I went there to see, can the environment, tourism, and the local people work together? And I found that they could. So as we were driving in, in our safari car, there we had to stop several times for Maasai, Maasai to graze their cow and let their sheep walk by. All of the grass was very green and lush and not overgrazed at all. It was growing to a reasonable height before it was being grazed. And people were free to move about. In our campsite, goats and sheep and donkeys would wander in and out and enjoy the water wherever it was and enjoy the grass that was there and the shrubs that were there, there to eat, which you would never see in a national park in Tanzania because the local people face a fine or death to their cattle if they let them graze inside of a national park. So on one of our last days, we went on a hike. And the most interesting thing about this hike, first off, was there were goats just running around on the trail, which you would never see in a park in Tanzania. Um, and they were freely grazing, and the pastoralists were free to graze their animals wherever they wanted to, and it worked out really well. And another interesting thing was there's a big PVC black pipe running to the top of the hike as the hike ended at a waterfall. And it was running along the trail the whole way up, and there were a few pipes here and there, or one or two. And the pipes ended at the waterfall itself, and traveled the water from the waterfall all the way to the local farm so that people could irrigate their land, something you would never see in a national park. When a park is established, the local people cannot enter the park to get the water. They have to wait for it to trickle out if it does at all. They're not welcome to go in and get their medicinal plants. And if they sneak in to get them, they face a fine or uh, some sort of punishment. And I found that in Tanzania, this sort of management works. And the way that we think of management in the US doesn't work abroad. It doesn't work everywhere. And now that I have this knowledge, I can use it in my environmental policy studies and further land conservation throughout the US and the world. So uh, I'm really excited about what I discovered. And this is Lake Natron with a rainbow. And I would like to thank uh, the Venture Grant Committee, CC, the Keller family, Anne Hakim, and Phil Cannon, and the people of Tanzania. And that's me at the end of my trip on Kilimanjaro. And our next presenter is Addis Goldman. He will be presenting on globalization in Venice, and his research advisor was Tim Fuller, professor of political science. Hey. So um, I was lucky enough to travel to Venice, Italy, for the 14th International uh, Architecture Exhibition at the Biennale. It's called Fundamentals. It was curated by Rem Koolhaas. Um, the Biennale is a 100-year-old arts festival. It takes place in these two venues for six months every year. This is a huge sprawling garden called the Giardini Gardens. Um, that's an arsenale, the old Venetian war arsenal. Um, the goal of this year's Biennale was two-pronged, basically to provide people with a historical overview of the last 100 years of architecture and to look at globalization and architecture and kind of ask more generally the question, this is an absurd thing that I saw, um, <laughs> has national identity been sacrificed to modernity all over the world? So I start my first day, I go to San Marco Square, the busiest part of Venice. I bump into people listening to automated tours of their architectural surroundings, it's crazy. I duck into this art gallery, start talking to this woman, and she says that people regularly ask her, where's the exit? So this was like totally 
scary and startling for me because it made me realize that people treat Venice like a theme park and that basically all of Venice has been sacrificed to the tourism industry. Um, so with that in mind, I went to the Fundamentals um, exhibition, which is not all doom and gloom. Um, so now I'm going to kind of just go through a random smattering of unique, compelling, intriguing, quirky, weird things that I saw. Uh, this is the first exhibit I saw on the left, the Belgian exhibit. They painted a room white, which I thought was a total slacker exhibition, but they basically <laughs> wanted you to realize that the interiors of houses change with the tenants and that we tend to look at facades and think nothing's going on in there, but actually unique people live in unique interior spaces. So this, the Biennale is all about this kind of thing, like you know, uh, looking at people in space and people relating to architecture. Then you have this room where there was, you know, what, the walls and walls and walls of different door handles, you know, crazy. This is like a taxonomy, a total catalog of architecture. So they went into everything. This is one of my favorite things. They called this the architecture of security. This is like a TSA airport security experience. My favorite part's the anti-fatigue mat that you stand on. So <laughs> a lot of it is subversive, and it's all about you making fun of architecture and stuff, but it's also a kind of celebration of the fundamentals of architecture. This is a room with like a hundred doors in it, all different, over a hundred years, the most hundred emblematic doors of the period or the decade. This was a, this was an absurd thing. You know, they did this for showers, for kitchens, for sinks, you know, 19 ways to wash your hands, 19 ways to get in and out of your shower, in and out of your bathtub. So there's all sorts of, it's not all globalization stuff, it's kind of art everything. Um, so these will go on for a little bit, but eventually I got to the Swiss Pavilion, and they mostly focused on the work of the Swiss sociologist named Lucius Burkhardt, um, whose goal was to kind of shake us out of how we interact with urban space. Um, he wanted us to question what we value in an urban landscape. Um, you know, why do we, why do, why do we turn certain things into tourism monuments? Why do we um, make sidewalks you know, here, here's this thing. This is kind of the funniest thing. This is something Flora would do. Um, <laughs> he, he kind of he made this like taxonomy of a sidewalk. So he'd put fake Latin names for you know the the strip of sidewalk he calls nature band aids, um, <laughs> you know, in the middle of a square. And he kind of wanted to shake people up and make them think. Why? What do we disregard about urban space when we highly regard certain types of urban space? So I went from the Swiss pavilion thinking about Burkhart um, in the context of Venice. And I realized as I walked back to San Marco Square to get my ferry, to catch my ferry, bumping into tourists, listening to automated tours of their surroundings, that Venice has kind of been sacrificed to the tourism industry. So it was kind of ironic that one of the aims of the Biennale, the globalization aim, was playing out in Venice right in its own right in the Biennale's backyard. So I was kind of, the Biennale was astounding organizationally and artistically, but it was very alarming to see the thesis of the Biennale happening right in Venice. Um, and I kind of closed with this picture of a farm that I spent, this is the farm, this farm that I spent the last m a month on after my venture grant, um, because Rem Coolhouse on the Fundamentals Biennale brochure has written, there's no better architect than the forces of nature. There's no better architects than the forces of nature. Um, so I kind of left the tourism world and ended up on this pastoral dream farm, um, wondering what architecture was better, you know, the na natural world's architecture or our architecture. And um, I'd like to thank the Keller family and Ray and Julian and whoever else helped us along the way that I don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> Our next presenter is Nate uh, Mankovich, and he's presenting on through hiking with a purpose. His research advisor is Mike Sidaway, who's associate professor of mathematics and computer science and is associate dean of the college. Thanks, Julian. Nice pronunciation of my last name. That was on, <laughs> on spot. That was good. <laughs> spot on. Anyhow, OK, right arrow, you yeah. said? All right. So I guess the first quest question you would ask is what is through hiking? Through hiking really is just hiking from trailhead to trailhead, hiking from point A to point B. 
Uh, this summer I hiked the Colorado Trail in 24 days. Uh, it's 480 miles. It starts at Waterton Canyon Trailhead by Denver, and it goes the whole way down to Durango to Trailhead. Um, so kind of my goal of this whole trip was to hike and see how my surroundings change me and how this experience can change me and bring back those sort of changes to Colorado College and, um, experience and kind of show people what I learned. So here it is. So what I carried on my trip was a backpack, a bivy sack, which I slept in, um, in a sleeping bag and a sleeping pad. I had a puffy journal, you know, various different layers. Um, I only carried about five days of food per hike, per, uh, per ration period. So hiking all day alone, like what do you think about? So originally, um, when I hike, I think about, you know, past experiences or think about the future. Um, but I started changing the way that I thought reading uh, John Muir's My First Summer in the Sierra on the trail. So if you don't know John Muir, he's a na celebrated naturalist from the 1800s. He co-founded the Sierra Club. He helped establish Yosemite as a national park, one, our first national park. Um, so he's a really incredible guy with a lot of insights. And just reading his journal or his story really helped me ground myself in my experience and the nature that I was ex in the nature um, as I was hiking. So in that, it changed my style. No longer was I hiking thinking about the future or what I was going to be taking when I started school again. I started thinking about things like, you know, like my surroundings and looking at this beautiful sunrise. Like uh, I woke up at 3 a.m. one morning to hike Mount Elbert a little bit off trail. It's um, the tallest mountain in Colorado. And so this is sort of the arrows follow the sunrise. And I sort of got, got into this routine, enamored with my landscape, sort of focused on just the little things and the beautiful portrait uh, you know, in front of me. And so here, hiking in the San Juans, um, I was just awestruck and able to really focus on um, what was happening, which allowed me to hike 29 miles in a day when I needed to. So you know, flowers really painted my landscape. Those flowers back there, the red ones in the previous photo, you can see them on the left here. That's an Indian paintbrush. Um, and on the far right is our state flower, the columbine. So, it was just incredible. Like they really, insp you know, reading John Muir's book and doing this hike inspired me to do some sketches of the flowers, which I kept in my journal, and allowed me to reflect on my experiences, past and present, um, while still remaining for remaining grounded in my present experience. I also made some simple discoveries. I don't know if you know this, but I grew up in Boulder, Colorado, and I've been around aspens all my life, and I never realized until on this hike that aspens change color in the rain. They're green after a rain, and uh, after they dry, they turn white. <laughs> Just beautiful, beautiful. And so later on the hike, um, you know, I experienced tons of incredible animals. Uh, to your left, you can see a ptarmigan. Uh, in the center is a, what is it, a garter snake. And on the right is a um, pika. So the garter snake was really incredible because, like, you see them all the time in suburbia, or at least I have, in the garden, in the garden at my house. and. Um, you know, seeing them out in the nature, out in the wilderness, really sort of had its own special appearance to me and really changed the way that um, I approached animals. So, as John Muir says, just bread and water and delightful toil is all I need. So, and really that's all that I got into this. I fell into this rhythm of hiking, eating, and sleeping, and it was just excellent, it just absolutely pure. And so I experienced some of the greatest highs that I've ever had. This is me, you know, the smile tells the whole, whole story. So <laughs> this is me at the top of uh, the highest point on the Colorado Trail, and it was just breathtaking. And so this is when, we fin when I finished the Colorado Trail. I hiked the last five days with my dad, so he took these last couple photos. Um, so this is just, I started to think like, okay, what next? Like, I started to lose that attachment to the present moment, um, you know, right at the finish. But on the drive back, my dad took this photo. This is the sunset driving back that 20, 24 day journey in six hours. And, you know, I sort of, again, got attached to the moment and just like really started focusing and finding this intense focus again by um, just looking at the sunset. And so the take home to y'all, I would say is just try to, um, you know, when you find yourself caught, it's really easy to get caught up in like thinking about, okay, you know, what's due tomorrow? What's my next assignment? What's my next meeting? Or in the past, like, oh, like, 
like, uh, oh, I shouldn't have said this, or I should have uh, spent less time on that last slide there, or something like that. <laughs> like, find yourself centered in the present slide, in the present moment, and what's going on right now. So I would <laughs> appreciate that if you guys did that, attempted to do that, and I promise you, you'll find a much more centered and more focused lifestyle. So I'd like to thank the Keller family, and um, Mike Sidaway, and Ray and Julian for allowing me to do this incredible adventure. Thank you. And our last presenter is Naya Herman, who will be presenting on creating community by fire. And her research advisor was Mario Montano of uh, anthropology and the chair of molecular biology. Hi, I'm Naya, and um, my venture grant is pretty unorthodox, but uh, it's basically about getting a giant meat smoker <laughs> from Massachusetts to Colorado. Um, so um, this would not have been possible uh, without a bunch of help from a lot of people. So in this presentation, I'm going to tell you kind of the who, how, what, and why of how to go about this. So um, Mario Montagno was so helpful. Um, he helped me with like last minute uh, proposals and uh, writing, but Lucas uh, was the creator of Carnivore Club way back when, and he sort of was my connection to alumni, so he helped me fundraise. Um, Joshua is the supervisor of the grounds crew here at CC, so he helped me figure out where we're going to store this thing, how we're going to bring it around. Um, and then Bethany and Ray were helpful in figuring out like which forms to sign, which grants to apply for, and um, where to sign the T's. Um, so, what's next? Oh yeah, so Carnivore Club uh, was the first um, club that I joined uh, a few years back, and I see Carnivore Club as kind of like the club that supports other clubs. So, there's like 300 clubs at CC, and uh, if you have an event that you want people to come to, Carnivore Club is, will go and kind of make food there. Um, this was the budget that I was working with. Um, there were some issues with the PowerPoint, so it might be a little fuzzy, but uh, basically, the Venture Grant um, allowed me to go this summer to work in Martha's Vineyard and um, work with this guy named Tim Larson, who is the welder of our smoker and um, the creator of Local Smoke, which is a small meat catering company in Martha's Vineyard. So we worked together and I learned about how to use the smoker. Um, and there's a little video. Our farming practices are that I'm trying to make the best wholesome food for my family, and it's just the purpose somebody who buys it. Having a farm is working for yourself. So Tim and I worked this summer um, doing like small events, um, and he basically just taught me how to serve large numbers of people. So this is um, the first smoker that Tim ever built, and ours looks a little bit different than this, but um, basically that's like one of the pros of going with like one person versus like a large company. Um, we got to kind of make it exactly what we wanted so our smoker is going to have like a small grill attached to it um it's really easy to smoke meat uh basically you just kind of make a fire and tend it for eight to twelve hours and um uh so it's really accessible to anybody on campus our smoker will be able to um fit four pigs at a time so i'm not sure if we'll ever use that many but um i hope we do i think we should um, and yeah, I, I think this project was really important to me um, for a lot of different reasons, but just wanted to make sure that uh, everybody at CC could use it. This is the TS500. This is sort of like the big company's version of what we have. So uh, Meadow Creek Barbecue makes this, and this was sort of the model I was looking at to kind of compare in price and specifications. Um, this is my boss at a restaurant that I worked at this summer using the smoker, and it was just, like so cool to see how many people got to use it and just like how many people got involved um, in the project. And um, so this brings me to the kind of like the why. Why would we need a meat smoker? Or why would we do any venture grant? Um, and I just want to say I think the venture grants are such a unique privilege, and uh, I can't really imagine another time where we could like walk into a room full of adults and say like, hey, let's bring a giant meat smoker from Massachusetts to Colorado and have people say, hell yeah, like, let's do that. <laughs> let me help you do that. Um, so I'm just like really humbled by how CC has been excited about this passion and um, really grateful to the Keller family and everyone else that helped me with this project. And
And that concludes our presentations. So next, we will be transitioning to the question and answer period. So if our speakers would join me on stage, I will <coughs> get out the chairs as fast as I'm able. <laughs> It's all right. I'll take the far end. Oh, all right. So we kind of decided that the, that the speakers uh, will kind of get to choose who they uh, get questions from <laughs> for comfort's sake. So if you have a question, kind of like class, just raise your hand and one of our speakers will uh, address that. Well, I have a question for you guys as a group. You haven't been chosen yet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, until tonight or today or whatever, how much have you all interacted in knowing what, and the others who did projects, in knowing what you all were up to and sort of talked and discussed your projects with each other? Do you mean specifically the 12 of us or the all, all, all of the I mean, just the whole venture grant. Like, to what extent do you all know what each other are doing and researching and, co and what, how do you collaborate and get sort of support from each other? I would throw in not enough. Yes. <laughs> um, the creating community by fire, I had no idea. Until so just cool. Now. Didn't know we had a main smoker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's, been, she's been holding that back. Like that. Yeah. Where was that tonight? <laughs> <laughs> I would have really liked some smoked meat. I hope that's okay. not. It's, it's apparently it's in between here and there. Yeah, that actually, oh, it's, it's on its way. It'll be here right. in the block. But, um, <laughs> yeah. Less like the bigger shit. I'd say yeah. the venture guys are kind of a little myth. CC, they're not a, they're real, but you know, people know, oh, I remember that person's venture grant. And they're kind of this like healthy competitive thing. So I think people know about past venture grants in a way. I mean I've been friends with them for a long time, so I knew this. But personally I I only know like, two people, three people on stage. I've never even <laughs> so I think it's an awesome way, just this venue and it within itself is a really cool experience to hear what other people are doing and see everyone's passions kind of come together. I think there's a lot of chatting that surrounds the application process and coming up with ideas, mm -hmm. um, although I wish that there was more talk around mm -hmm. what happens after. Mm -hmm. I feel like that, that's definitely true, like we already know what other projects are going on. But uh, how I found out about venture grants and what other people are doing is that there's a little pet flip and you read like, through all the venture grants and you're like, well, that's cool. Like, what if I do this with it? Um, so I feel like you know this forum is, is great, it's fantastic. People get to see what we do, but I feel like they should be it, ha it should happen more than once. And what about the other 80 students? What they did? We want to see that. <laughs> so I think it can be it can definitely be more interaction between us. Yeah. Um, I know that Cora and a few of us and Ray were talking beforehand about possibly a website with like pinpoint locations of where everyone is um, on a website and then just popping up a little bio about each one and I think that would be an excellent idea. Yeah, that map that you got tonight is that the first little thought engine about that. What kind of interesting? Erica. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's for Adam and um, oh, Brad. Brad. Um, <laughs> I was just curious. Um, how did you find the people that you're interviewing, and um, and yeah, how did you find the people you're interviewing? Uh, um, well, I'd say we started out a lot. Well, we kind of had like a rough, uh, like kind of journey we wanted to do from the snowpack to the sea, and then we kind of just like thought from that, like we brainstormed like. Uh, drought impacts in between, 
And then from that, we made phone calls. And then from that, we told a lot. Of, one of the best, I think, things we had was talking to kids at CC whose families are involved in that. Like um, Jim Sacamano, the guy we showed, um, his daughter goes to CC, and I know her. So um, a lot of it was like word of mouth. But then, like you know, you also have very much you, you, you run into people and like they, you t they're like, oh, what, what are you doing with that camera and that crazy device? And you like, you know, you say what you're doing. Like, yeah, we're, we're making a project about the drought in California. And like, oh, I used to come to this, you know, this waterfall and it used to be three times the size. It's like, can you say that on camera? <laughs> <laughs> honestly, honestly, those types of interviews were probably the most emotional and I think will stand out the most in our movie versus some of the science-based Hydrologist and things like that. Those are good too, though. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's a good. It's a good one. <laughs> uh, how many of your projects were um, kind of informed by things that you had done in school versus things that you're interested in pursuing later mm -hmm. on, career-wise or in your studies? So, like things that you've already studied and thought you wanted to take further versus things that maybe you thought. This could be cool to learn about, and I might want to pursue that. Um, I am a co-chair of SAUCE, which is Students Organized for Sexual Safety, and an issue that we face a lot is sort of the preaching to the choir. So students that are already interested in sexual assault will show up to the events that we have, but maybe the students that uh, need to learn about sexual assault more don't, don't feel like they have to, so they won't come. So that was one of the reasons why um, Carnivore Club feels so important to me, because I feel like Every, not everyone, but almost everyone loves meat, and um, <laughs> that's like a great way to bring people together. And um, so I guess uh, I'm not sure if I will take that in my future in any way, but just that kind of mentality of like how to bring people together and how can we all be kind of involved in cooking or uh, you know the process of uh, sharing our passions. I found that the, my venture grant was a response to research I was required to do as a class while I was abroad, and then that helped me spark, an that sparked an interest in me in ecology research. So this past summer, I was with the CC professor on Pikes Peak, and now I'm graduating in the spring, and it's like, wow, I really, I found that I liked this a lot, and maybe I want to keep doing it. So it gave another um, direction for my future. Yeah, it's pretty much just a good way to fuel, um, and by fuel, I mean fun, your interest. Uh, academic interest, like I'm a film, I'm a film major, uh, environmental policy, a film minor, environmental policy major, and grad an econ major, and that's like, very pertinent to the drought that we made. So it's like we want to do this, um, and we don't want to pay for it out of pocket entirely. So and just the collaboration among friends is is so awesome. Be able to bounce ideas back and forth between each other really, I think, was really important. I found it to be very helpful, sort of reinforcement of my own. Um, I don't know, I've always thought that I was very sure I wanted to go to medical school and that I had this ideal of I want to work overseas, I want to, you know, be a doctor in a developing country, but this is, you know, I actually did it, you know, and Corey did too, and we both were sort of just amazed by how real that actually is and how much need there actually is, and it sort of just brought it home in such a tangible way that we couldn't have, I don't know, been able to experience it so firsthand. And it's also really helpful because it motivates the school. You know, the school gets really hard sometimes and yeah. you get a little burnout and it's really great to sort of be reminded, yeah, this is what I'm going for. This is why I'm dying in physics too right now. <laughs> <laughs> this is this the end goal. For me, um, since I was five, I was I was that kid who would not stop asking I would always put blast my mind, like, what does red blood cell look like? What, like, how do we grow up? Like, I, I was asked so many questions, my parents got so sick of me, they just bought me books instead of answering my questions. <laughs> um, so, and then uh, as I got older, I, in classes, I was still so many questions. Um, to the extent, like, my professor was like, I don't know the answer to that question. My research, like, hasn't got there yet. And so for, for me, the opportunity to be able to be the front line of research, and like I'll sink to my bacteria, I will like, you know, be there. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, um, but what, what is it like to hear? What kind of song? Singing aria? Bacteria. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess I don't know. It's a terrible thing, but you know, it's, 
Um, I, I, I like to think that helps them grow. Um, but um, I, it was amazing to be able to like answer my own question this time. I don't have to rely on other people. I don't. I, I can. You know, sometimes a lot of time experiments fail. You know, they don't work. And um, and um, and that really has like told me like I love research and my ability to go and present your research with other people, share your knowledge with other people is just amazing. And that's definitely confirmed something that I want to continue on after college. For for me, um, before I went to. Bolivia with the engineers of our I was kind of interested in physics and considering going to engineering grad school, but actually experiencing the project in Bolivia made me to want to be a developmental engineer. I wanted to design my own major, which would be called developmental engineering, but my academic advisor actually recommended it me to take all the 300 level of physics classes, which would be more helpful for me um, in going to a grad school. So this was really motivational for me to pursue this career in development and engineering. It was just um, how long did it take in between like, when you came up with your idea and you actually like, finalized plans? Like, like, mm -hmm. like, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, <laughs> somebody else going to say two months. <laughs> two months. <laughs> two months. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> slowly, slowly two months. Yeah, give it, yeah. Yeah, for me, it's not really fast. When the internet works in Tanzania. <laughs> so like two days, but really like two months because there's no power. <laughs> no, but you need like a, a question, just like a good paper, and then you start gathering things about it, and then... I would say if you're it. passionate about it, and you have a really good idea outline of what exactly you want to do, and specifically where you want to go, and like if you have it all in your head, you can make it happen pretty quickly. Definitely. But if you're sort of nebulous and you're just kind of like, eh, maybe I want to go here, but I don't really know what I'm going to do there, it's going to take you a while longer. Yeah. But I think taking the time to like really ask those questions, yeah. like I think the process of figuring out like, you know, I don't know exactly what I want to do, or maybe your your idea changes. Um, I think there's, you know, she That's definitely that. yeah take take value in that. How many of you, so you I know, you showed the funding that it was like $10,000. Mm -hmm. How many of you needed to seek additional funding above and beyond just this venture grant? All of you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's cheap. <laughs> 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 I hope you have it in a high earning portfolio now. <laughs> 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 I think uh, the only additional funding I had was some triple A reimbursement from like, <laughs> car brands. <laughs> <So, laughs> that works out. So triple A gets I'll, your I'll advertise out. for Jill here that you can apply for five hundred dollars to Jill's office. Uh oh, now and the deans. Mm -hmm. Um, I got. Um, no, I got fundings from the student faculty collaboration research, um, and our research is also funded by the National Science Foundation, um, and our lab is, uh, kind of, we have three people in it, and one of our lab mates, Caroline, is sitting right there, um, and, um, you know, I, I, but I think the venture grant definitely adds so much to it, without a reason to be able to buy some, like, Western block, it costs about $1,000 per kid. Well, they come to develop this small. Um, so, yes, I had other fundings, but uh, the venture was definitely a huge part of it. Can I add something to that quickly? Um, the venture grant was like the first piece of it, and I remember when I applied, I was like, they're just going to laugh at this. Like, there's no way I'm going to get this. But Ray called me, and she's like, this is such a cool idea. And I, I was like, wow, like, there's one person, like, I got the venture grant, like, maybe this is real. And, like, that's definitely what kind of push me to keep going. And the venture grant can be used as leverage. Uh, yeah, <laughs> the one thing that's great about the venture grant is that it's really open-ended and uh, is awarded for all different types of projects. And there are a lot more really great funds on campus, but maybe they're harder to track down or a little bit more specific. So I think that like my partnership with the venture grant actually really helped me kind of seek out additional funding. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. What are, what are the different roles that your faculty advisors play? 
letters of uh, ideas, <laughs> different ways to, to think about the way that I was approaching the hike. Because like you can just walk and walk, but like you know, it sort of puts puts your grant into context and sort of um, helps you make it more meaningful, um, especially with something that I was doing which you might have just sort of see just like a walk. If you were to do if you were to do another like again, what have you thought about what that might be or the fact that it stimulate a dozen ideas, one idea? Personally, just listening to Cora and Ellen's, I would absolutely love to do something like that. Um, we have plans actually to go back this winter. Um, I'm a sociology major with pre med and a Spanish minor. So Ellie actually mentioned this organization. Uh, Partners for Rural Health in the Dominican on a ski lift the Friday before the venture grant was due. So I will speak to the fact that you can get it in if you have the plans fall into your lap. Um, but yeah, we want to go back and we want to bring something to this organization. Um, I would personally like to see nursing students learn more Spanish because I think it would be a respectful culture of competency sort of thing. Um, we also are looking to talk with uh, adolescent girls because we think we can relate to them and find out what's going on with stigmas and ideas around female health in general. And that's kind of like, it's especially important to me because that's actually what I got my grant for to go to Kenya the first time. So it all ties in together. We're really excited about it. And answering your question, uh, my advisor was Tara Misra, who's a sexual assault response coordinator. And she actually gave me tons of homework and made me read all of these articles about like, who guidelines and CDC guidelines and different people who have done studies on sexual health in Kenya. It was just pages and pages and PDFs and it was great because it gave me this really beautiful context to walk into it. It's really helpful. I think now that I've done the, the science grant, listening to Ben talk about, I like Mexican food so yeah. I want to study it. I love <laughs> running and I would love to go and study running culture throughout the U.S. and run different races through like a sociological lens or a anthropology lens and I think it's great because you can do something that's very academic and something that could be published in an academic journal or you can really engage your liberal arts education and look at something that you associate with every day and try and see it through a more academic lens. I mean just to pick up what Juzi was saying, what I think was great about the venture grant is it really expands the boundary of your classroom at CC but as a liberal arts school you know we really have the privilege and the opportunity to study not just our personal academic interests but also things that are very interesting to us too. So if that's something like food justice or even just like the celebration of food and culinary heritage, you can work with an advisor to develop a focused research plan and really make that happen. Are you so, share yeah. the best mole recipe? <laughs> <laughs> it takes three days to share. <laughs> <laughs> If you could encapsulate your um, experiences in the context in one word, what would it be? Independent. Life changing. <laughs> Delicious. <laughs> Missouri sauna, which means very good in Swahili. So. I use discoveries. Maybe heart wrenching. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately. <laughs> Life affirming. Family. Adaptability. Yeah, oh, that's good. That's <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> yeah. In the back? Yeah. Okay, so I'm a freshman and I have I'm like really passionate about this idea that I have. But I'm really nervous that I'm going to like develop in my academics here and I'm going to have like really great other ideas. And the fact that I kind of like, not blew it, but I used it like my freshman year, I'll like never <laughs> be able to have the opportunity again. Is it like detrimental? So uh, like, will you be able to get it twice if you have yeah. two really good ideas? Yeah, yeah. I, I received, uh, uh, I was actually lucky enough to receive two venture grant trips, uh, two venture grants, uh, the other one for the Engineers Bravo Boris National Conference. And I also attended the lunch with Re Evit, and she was speaking that some people received even three uh, in their CC career. Technic <laughs> technically, they consider you like a little bit less than a first-time application, 
but that doesn't stop you. And don't be worried about wasting it. <laughs> no, and go for it. Absolutely go yeah. And also, there are so many other grants. So if yeah. you can start with venture grant and then look for other grants and ask your academic advisor or just ask around, there is just a lot of opportunities mm -hmm. to get support from CC. Yeah, um, I would say like we're screening. Our, another plug. We're screening our movies, <laughs> and they're both funded by venture grants, and they're wildly different. Like one was in Nepal, and one was in California. So it's like you can. It's it's great for anything. <laughs> Were you all chosen, or did you volunteer to present? <laughs> we applied and were chosen. Yeah. How, how did you choose your advisor? Knocked on doors in the UV department. <laughs> <laughs> the doors that open. I think Ray would probably be a good person to talk to about that, but I think you guys like it if the advisor's tied in some way to the subject of the grant. Yeah. Not just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And also, uh, the advisor writes you a recommendation, so preferably a person who knows you well and can write a good recommendation. Well, yeah. I didn't know Mario Montano at all. I've never taken a class with him, and I just heard that he likes me, so I, like, <laughs> 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 I like, reached out to him, and I like, sent him my proposal, and he was just like, yeah, this sounds great. Like, I'd be happy to help. <laughs> <laughs> Anything for a smoker. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if there are no other questions, uh, I want to thank the Keller family and Colorado College for making this happen for all these students once more. And I think we can all give a nice round of applause for our presenters. They did an excellent job. So, Naya, have I got a deal for you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <coughs> How long ago was it? This is a really great story because it involves all these people in this room. It, it, the, 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 you can't leave. Uh, <laughs> all right. So uh, maybe a year and a half ago, my wife and I got late at night. Nothing good happens late at night. <laughs> we got talked into taking on three Nubian goats by the guy over there and his wife, who were smart enough to think that at the beginning of the summer when they're cute and they're laying, you know, little, little, uh, uh, goatlets and, uh, and, and fun and engaging and the kids get to bottle feed them and all that stuff, that there will be some sucker that will come along at the end of the summer who will take them. <laughs> so we have these goats <laughs> and I think that they would, they would fill your smoker <laughs> <laughs> nicely. <laughs> if you can get four pigs, you can get our three goats. And if that smoker has not gone by Wisconsin, I will make the call and we can get this set up. <laughs> No, no, we'll, we, we'll ship them. Right. We'll ship them. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, but can I? Uh, yes. <laughs> Jeff, when, I saw that smoker, when I saw that smoker, Jeff, I thought, how many, I wonder, I'm going to tease you later, how many goats would fit in that? Oh, no. They, <laughs> they, will, all they fit. will fit perfectly. <laughs> and whatever doesn't fit, we can deal with. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm so glad to hear there's a carnivore club. I would think that CC would, you know, have the veggie club, and that would be the big club. <laughs> but, uh, Sometimes we have veggie burgers, but all right, good. <laughs> well, too. can I can I just I, I don't have much to add because you guys have really said it all. So I want to thank all of you, and 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 Jill and Ray and and Julian and everybody that's involved with this program, Sean, for you know letting our family participate. I mean, this is really spectacular and uh, it's something that's very special and I want to also applaud this format because I think this is cool and I for those of you that came spread the word I mean this is pretty good entertainment for a, 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 a you know a cold uh, winter's night here uh, in November um, and it's it really you know is at the center of what this is all about uh, you know and I think you realize this so I'm not going to stand up here and preach and tell you about all these things that you're going to get from doing a venture grant you've already got it so what happened? You know, you have a passion. You want to do something. The smoker, your idea. It's going to be great. You've got to sell it then, which is something that you're going to have to do throughout your life. To be able to do that, you have to articulate it. And you, you guys have articulated it. Uh, you know, we saw the final product post-execution, and it's spectacular. But in order to get there, you have to be able to articulate it, you know, so that you gain enthusiasm and momentum. And you talked about that with your advisors. You talked about that with how 
you've gone around the college. I also was glad, I mean, I felt like we were a little lightweight on your funding there at the bottom. So the goats are going to help with that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you had to go a lot of places. And, and that's going to be true uh, uh, in everything that you do. So you, you, you articulate these ideas. You, you gain enthusiasm, momentum. You get to go out there and execute. And it's not just walking. It's, it's so much more than that. And I think that what, what I would just like to say quickly is that not only is it vitally important to you and to this community here at CC, but as, as you guys were, were in these other parts of the world and seeing what's going on, I mean, this is what is going to be fundamental to where we go from here. And it's this kind of risk taking and this, these kind of ideas and the creativity and the innovation and the thinking outside of the box. And what do you do? My truck, I have had this experience. I watched my truck towing in the middle of the night in Africa from a crane because I happened to drive it off the road. <laughs> and so you say to yourself, you know, how are we going to overcome this? How are we going to problem solve? How are we going to get through it? And, and you did. And this project that you're going to, I would love to be able to stay and see the movie, uh, movies. But uh, yeah, send me a copy. And the idea of a website and the idea of just continuing, and the question that I would ask, and you guys can answer it later, we won't do it right now, is how do we make the program even better? You know, how do we, how do we you know, I know Jill wants to do it. She's excited about it. Our family is excited about it. So the opportunities for improvement, um, you know, that's, that's a big part of it as well. So help us and be the, the feedback mechanism and, and keep putting some time, sorry, you keep putting some time into this. We just unloaded our goats. Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, that is, that is great. so uh, <laughs> as as an alum, and you know, speaking on behalf of my brother as an alum as well, you know, this this is an awesome place. This is a really awesome place, and we we struggled a little bit in one regard getting here today with some <laughs> issues, and in the first two seconds of watching you guys walk up here, it was so worth it. So thank you all, and help uh, keep this moving and moving forward and growing. It's exciting. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.